heart of where innovation, money, and power collide in Silicon Valley and beyond. This is Bloomberg Technology with Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow. I'm Caroline Hyde at Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York. And I'm Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg Technology. And full coverage ahead on the SEC's approval of Bitcoin ETFs. What does it mean for the $1.7 trillion digital asset sector? We'll discuss. And Hertz makes a U-turn on its EV push as the company announces it's selling 20,000 electric vehicles after overestimating demand. Plus, the tech industry is kicking off the new year with some significant job cuts. We'll break it all down. Let's have a little look at what's happening, though, in the asset of choice for today and indeed yesterday. We've got to look at Bitcoin. It has had a volatile trading session, actually. At one point, almost eclipsing that $49,000 handle. We're anticipating, of course, the adoption RBC saying, what, 50 to $100 billion of inflows for the first year due to these ETFs. 11 of them, of course, go live today, Ed. Time for some team coverage. Let's break it all down and bring in Bloomberg, Shanali Basak and Katie Greifeld. And Katie, I want to start with you. I guess the question is, where do we look now for reaction to the news? We've shown the equity markets. Caro showed her risk asset of choice, Bitcoin. But there's also some flows data that shows us the story here. Specifically, you want to be looking at the trading volume. That's what we know right now. We'll get that flow data tomorrow, theoretically. But you take a look at who's winning the volume race so far. You have Grayscale and you have BlackRock out in front. All told, you've had 32 million shares of GBTC trade over for BlackRock. That comes in around 26 million shares. All told, all 11 of these ETFs all together have traded about 2.8, almost $2.9 uh, billion so far. So really a lot of volume on day one. For GBTC, there is some speculation that this really for a lot of investors is the first time that they have had a chance to sell. So Bloomberg Intelligence, for for example, has theorized that maybe that selling pressure for BlackRock, there's a lot of speculation out there whether they preceded this fund, whether you're seeing that come through in the trading volumes. I asked uh, Jay Jacobs at BlackRock that uh, about uh, an hour and a half ago. Didn't get much of an answer there, but a lot of theories as to what's actually behind this volume. And there's the mechanics. There's the infrastructure. Shanali, then there's the ultimate view on whether this is really the turning point, whether this means mass scale adoption, whether suddenly people on their IRAs in the pension funds start just sprinkling in a little bit of Bitcoin. When we look at the price action of the OG of crypto, do we think that it is? Well, what's interesting is you did see trading volumes to the billions as you were hearing Katie saying, but when you look at the price action in Bitcoin itself, it uh, reached 49,000 very briefly on the day, but it's back well below uh, or fluctuating around 46,000. So this has not been the sell the news moment, nor has it been the buy the news moment since we have seen these ETFs start to take off. And even with that announcement of trading volumes being significant, you're still not seeing that movement in Bitcoin. And in fact, in some of the Bitcoin-related stocks, as Ed was saying, Coinbase being down more than 6%, a big question in the market is what this means for exchanges, let alone uh, Bitcoin itself. Now, I will point to one place you are seeing some action is Ethereum. Mm -hmm. And I think the reason that's interesting is because people believe that if you see a Bitcoin-related spot ETF, then the issuers, uh, if they are successful, will move to other products. Will they move to Ethereum? Now, one thing that's interesting about this is the SEC's own statement. Yeah. which was very clear that this was for one asset and one asset alone, Bitcoin, and it was not an endorsement of the Bitcoin world in itself. Yeah. And so you are seeing sparks of exuberance in Ethereum that you're not seeing the same way in Bitcoin at this moment. But is it founded is the question. And also sparks of exuberance, excitement, when it comes to an IPO pipeline related to crypto assets. Circle, the stablecoin issuer, what did we learn today? A long time coming as well, wasn't that? You all may remember that this was a company that tried to go public via a SPAC that was uh, overseen by Bob Diamond's company. And since that moment, we've been waiting many, many months to see what Circle's ultimate exit strategy would be. Remember, they had a tough road to get here. They had money tied up in the Silicon Valley Bank debacle. They were really able to pivot after that. And they have been able to hold their model into this IPO. Now, the stablecoin world is quickly changing. There's regulation around it. This is all colliding kind of at the same time here. And and is there a market for crypto-related, uh, stablecoin-related stocks? Remember, it's a different flavor of crypto asset at a time when the IPO market is supposedly opening up. Will be an interesting year.
Uh, Katie, the news of the approval, the official news, broke just before I went on stage with Adina Friedman at CES. And on stage I said, this is the breaking news. And there was a small ripple of applause, a small, and I emphasize small. But after that, the conversation I had with so many people is, wait, how many got approved? Do we need 11 of these things? No. That's the answer that I've no. gotten from pretty much everyone, issuers included, uh, not specifically on the record in a lot of cases. But the thinking is that, OK, this is a very crowded field. And the question becomes, how do you differentiate yourself if everyone's going at once and we all hold the same thing? And the answer has been to cut fees and then cut fees again. These fees are extremely low. You have Bitwise at the bottom there charging 20 basis points. That's their eventual fee. At the top, of course, you have GPTC charging 1.5%. That's a little bit of a different story there. But when it comes to where we are a year from now, what the assets in these 11 funds actually look like, uh, the expectation is that this will be a winner-take-most sort of environment, that you're going to have a handful of these funds holding the bulk of the assets. And it'll be interesting to see if uh, we actually whittle down here and some of these funds eventually do shut. Well, let's talk about one of those funds in a moment. Shanani Basak, Katie Greifeld, we thank you so much. We can go to one of those key issues of end spot Bitcoin ETF. Roger Basin's with us, Franklin Templeton, head of digital assets. You, of course, have launched the Franklin Bitcoin ETF today. Remind us of the fees. Remind us of why perhaps you think you're going to survive, at least within the 11 that we have. Well, I would just point to uh, Bloomberg's own research. People need to go. Uh, to Bloomberg to see how the fees line up for the issuers. I do think it's correct that the uh, you need to look at the longer term about where this goes. This has been a very dynamic issuing environment over the past several uh, days and weeks, and uh, we expect that um, the dust will settle in the period ahead. But for sure, uh, we believe this is a um, you know a page that's been turned in this chapter. Accessibility to Bitcoin outside of a digital wallet, inside of some of the more uh, you know, crypto native firms is what the story is here. It's no secret why we uh, use the ticker symbol EZBC <laughs> because that's the story right. of the day. Roger, the accessibility part is, is the most interesting to me. Who is taking advantage of this product? Have you specific evidence of whether it's kind of legacy investment managers uh, managing people's 401ks right through to the big institutionals that are active this morning? Well, I think, again, the story today and volumes that are happening today is, is something that will change and pivot as we get deeper into 2024, because the idea that there is a trusted brokerage account, I mean, we've had decades and decades of regulatory oversight um, on the brokerage industry, um, and as a result of that, the brokerage account has become a trusted um, infrastructure within the overall capital markets for uh, clients to hold. And so to bring... Uh, a Bitcoin exposure, which is really a story about the growing and evolving network economy, uh, by and large. Whether it's you know Bitcoin as a single-purpose network, or whether it's Ethereum, and the and the array of other public blockchain networks that are going to be used as really utilities for this data-driven economy going forward. I think that's a thematic story uh, that's going on. So I think we really want to point toward the longer-term thematic story. But it's this accessibility that opens up not just for individual investors, but for institutions also who are looking uh, for trusted infrastructure and trusted providers to bring these innovations alongside of their other investments. What's interesting is, of course, in the same breath as signing off on these ETFs, the SEC chair then went on to say that investors should remain cautious about the myriad of risks associated with Bitcoin and products whose value is tied to crypto. Roger, you are someone who's been at the cutting edge of this, trying to involve and build infrastructure over at Franklin Templeton, deciding how to involve digital assets more broadly with real world assets. What more is needed within the infrastructure space to make it that the SEC chair doesn't think that you should still be very cautious? Well, I think the SEC chairman is right to talk about caution. I mean, look, those of us who have been managing assets for our clients for dozens of years, there is volatility inside of this. You guys led with that story with the volatility, the daily volatility that happens. We think that's still going to exist in this space. The question is whether you're rewarded for taking that volatility. I think long-term metrics have certainly shown so far that uh, investors are are rewarded for taking that volatility and that risk and then putting these alongside other assets for generate best outcomes going forward. 
But you're correct. We have been working uh, closely with the SEC as it relates to blockchain technologies and, and, and using them as infrastructure inside of already traditional assets in order to increase utility for underlying savers. And so we see the caution um, right. and we understand it and we, we are alongside of that when we're counseling clients for risks in their portfolios in general. Uh, Roger, the halving coming up later in the year is a point of discussion in parallel with this ETF roller coaster. Have you modeled and planned for that and how will it impact the product in your business? You know, you know, past performance is not indicative of future results. However, if you look at previous halving uh, cycles, there it seems to be a technical situation. We all know that Bitcoin is a um, constrained asset. There's only a certain amount of supply. When that supply begins to be diminished, especially alongside this this environment of increased accessibility, um, it might create interesting technical dynamics flowing either way. But I think as you're seeing the market, as you put Arvin pointed out, is pivoting toward what are other public blockchain network infrastructure opportunities that investors may be able to tap. And so you've seen that price action diverge a little bit between Ethereum and Bitcoin in the, in the previous days. Just a timely skin in the game conversation. Roger Baston, Franklin Templeton, thank you so much. Some breaking news crossing the Bloomberg terminal in the last few moments. The FAA is formally investigating Boeing over the 737 MAX 9 incident of the weekend. The FAA said in a post on X that this incident should never have happened and it cannot happen again. Later on in that statement, it flags Boeing's manufacturing practices needing to comply with high safety standards that they are legally accountable to meet and they have attached a formal letter on that investigation. The shares you just saw there have been under pressure anyway. Reminder that what happened on that Alaska flight over the weekend is that a plug in the rear of that plane uh, detached mid-flight and now the FAA saying, Caroline, that there is a formal investigation relating to that incident. We stay on top of that story. We also stay on top of others that broke earlier today. Coming up, the Hertz decision to reverse course on its push into electric vehicles. Details ahead on the company's decision look to offload 20,000 electric vehicles. A lack of demand. We'll dig into it in a moment. This is Bloomberg Technology. In a major reversal after a large purchase of Tesla vehicles in 2021, Hertz announces it's going to sell 20,000 electric vehicles in return to buy gas-powered cars. Joining us now, Bloomberg's David Welch, our Detroit bureau chief. And David, this is a far cry from the plan. They were going to buy almost 350, 250,000 vehicles across Tesla, GM and Polestar. Now they're trying to get rid of them. What has Hertz said about why? Same thing they said in the third quarter, only more so. They, they had depreciation on the cars. So they've got this fleet of vehicles. Elon Musk cuts prices by 25, 30% on most models. That means the, the uh, resale value of Tesla vehicles out in the market hurts, including those that, that hurts itself is, uh, is carrying. So they had to take a, a, basically a charge for the disposition costs they have. They also had high repair costs for these vehicles. All that was hurting earnings, and they said in the third quarter that they actually missed Wall Street estimates of 77 cents a share by seven cents because of that. So when you look at that, they had to do something because EV prices are still challenged. They're at, they actually continue to come down. EV sales, new vehicle sales, still growing, but growing at a much slower pace. That has an impact on pricing in the used car market as well. All of this stuff is really related. So they had to make an adjustment. It also means down the line, they're they're going to buy fewer vehicles from GM and from Polestar. If they do buy 175,000 GM EVs, it'll be a, over a much longer period of time than five years. That's what Stephen Schur, the CEO, told me in an interview this morning. So there's a, there's a lot of not good for everybody here because Tesla will see pricing pressure. Uh, the people who own Teslas right now will see their resale value go down because it softens the market. And I think for car companies like GM, Polestar, and others who may have been hoping to use corporate fleet sales and rental sales, 
as a way to, to buttress demand as consumers maybe scratch their heads about EVs, that's not going to be an easy outlet for sales either. So it's, it's a big bump in the road for EVs and, and there's decent ripple effect out of this too. Yeah, David, the context comes as well with a story that was written up from Cox Automotive yesterday just showing that the demand for EVs isn't picking up pace particularly it feels as though what just 1.5 percent i think growth was eked out in the final quarter of last year and that's sequentially been going slower and slower how much is this signaling that ultimately the user isn't ready for an ev experience when they're going via hertz there's a lot of that going on. And look, just to be sure here, EV sales are growing. If you go look year over year, the numbers are pretty big. And last year was a record year for EV sales. But that third quarter to fourth quarter number, I thought, and it was my story, I thought it was significant, 1.3%. Third quarter, there are seasonal factors in there, but third quarter is usually a pretty strong quarter for auto sales because it's new model year turnover and a lot of new vehicles come out. Consumers are excited. Fourth quarter, also very strong because you have things like December to remember from Toyota and other sales that drive people to showrooms to buy cars. So those are two historically strong quarters for, yeah. for vehicle sales. And EV sales only grew 1.3% after growing 6% second quarter to third quarter and 14 before that. So yeah, still growth in the market if you look year over year, but it's definitely slowing down. People are wondering where they're going to charge them when they're out and about. And there yeah. still aren't many affordable EVs on the market despite the price cuts. There's only one on the market that sells for below $40,000. That's the Nissan Leaf. And and that doesn't go very far on a charge. So yeah, there, there's there's a lot that needs to be sold to consumers to get them to, to continue snapping up EVs in big numbers again. Well said. David Welch, great to get the breakdown with you. We thank you so much on that big about face. Meanwhile, let's get you some more breaking news. This time in the banking sector, Morgan Stanley is going to be paying under $300 million to settle that block trade probe. And Peter Station is still on set with us to break it all down. So the investigation was surrounding what exactly? Uh, the process of block trading, this was all bega uh, began in the wake of the Archegos trades. And you saw Morgan Stanley end up losing some talent over this, departing with the firm uh, over concerns about how some of these trades were handled. Now, what we're seeing is they're close to an agreement, according to sources telling our own Sridhar Natarajan, Ava Benny Morrison, and Austin Weinstein, that the charges could be between $200 million and $300 million. And while that may sound like a lot, it is a lot less than expected. Why this matters as well, it is one of the investigations that Morgan Stanley wanted to clear up in its succession plan as they moved uh, the baton from James Gorman over to Ted Pick over at Morgan Stanley. Now, the penalty will be divvied up between the Justice Department and the Securities and Exchange Commission, according to Bloomberg sources, and it will not include criminal charges against the bank, importantly. So this would be in the coming days, according to sources, and it would turn a page for Morgan Stanley that has been an overhang in the last several months. All right, Bloomberg Shinali Basak there with the breaking news. My goodness, has it been a sprint start to 2024? OK, time for Talking Tech. And first up, an advisor to the European Union's Court of Justice says Google should not win its appeal against a 2.6 billion antitrust fine. EU competition regulators slapped Google with the fine in 2017 for favouring its own shopping service over those of its rivals. And staying with EU regulation, concerns over Amazon's $1.4 billion deal to buy Roomba maker iRobot are coming to light after the tech giant missed a Wednesday deadline to file remedies to antitrust enforcers. The Competition Commission has set a February deadline to decide whether to approve or block the iRobot deal. Plus, 2024 is starting off with an uptick in tech layoffs in order to restructure and reduce costs. Google is now the latest company to cut staff, laying off hundreds of workers from its hardware, engineering and digital assistant teams. Kara. Bit of deja vu there, hey? And someone that we can dive into that very story with is Brody Ford, who perhaps is taking the temperature and mood of Silicon Valley right now, and it feels a bit dour again. Deja vu is right. I remember being here about a year ago, and we were hearing Salesforce layoffs, Google, Microsoft, tens of thousands of people, and this isn't quite that, right? I mean, we're not talking tens of thousands here. We're talking hundreds, which is still, you know, disruptive for individuals and a sign that the tech economy is not fully back to the kind of 
big growth days, right? Um, and so what this really is, it's a cautious sign for the tech industry that right now still, if you are working in a division that is not growing rapidly, mm -hmm. you might still be on the chopping block. And what about creative areas? I mean, yeah. the whole generative AI boom that kind of helped be the silver lining of the cloud of job losses ends up being a bit of a cloud if you're worrying about your job in the future. Maybe generative AI is kind of going to take it? Right. I mean, we saw Amazon Studios, Twitch, and then Duolingo, which the folks that were cut were in a lot of the content creation divisions. It's hard not to notice a trend here that some of these folks working on these consumer-facing aspects. I mean, I've spoken to sources at Duolingo who are translators who said that they were kind of told, like, look, AI can do your job, right? And we haven't seen that level of direct replacement. And I think the fact that those are starting to trickle in, it's not a warm sign, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it certainly isn't. And we're going to be staying on that particular story throughout, thankfully, through Brody Ford. We thank him thank so you. much. Quick check on these markets, Ed, because look, we have had the macro perhaps outweigh some of the exuberance around the crypto ETF. I'm looking at what's happening in NASDAQ because the CPI print was all important for those that are still trying to decide where the Federal Reserve goes. Look, ultimately, there's another reading, another print ahead of the all-important March meeting for the Federal Reserve. But still, the fact that CPI is running slightly hot does mean that maybe bets are being taken off the table for as soon as March rate cut. We're currently off by 8 tenths percent on the NASDAQ, of course. Bloomberg dollar index increases because of those anticipations that Maybe the cuts won't come as soon as anticipated. Bitcoin, though, all eyes trained on this after, of course, 11 ETFs go live today and spot Bitcoin ETF trading. We're off just by three tenths percent, but it has been a volatile ride at one point at 49,000. Before we get into that more broadly, look at some of the individual movers on the day and on some of the macro. Ma market capitalizations that we're focusing in on because check this out we are looking at microsoft in the blue about it looks like to eclipse the market capitalization again of apple in the white apple of course getting numerous sort of sell ratings or indeed going neutral on the stock we've been questioning the valuations we're worrying about china so market cap has taken a hit we're about 2.8 trillion for both companies at the moment move on to some of the individual movers when it comes to the world of crypto though because there has been this perhaps sell the fact kind of a move or ultimately digest the amount that we've run up in these stocks ahead of the all-important spot ETF sign-off from the SEC. Riot platforms down by 16%. MicroStrategy, of course, big holding of Bitcoin on its balance sheet up by 5%. CleanSpark, it's a mining company, off by almost 10%. So there has been a bit of weakness in today's trading, Ed. All right, let's get some more reaction on every single one of those themes. Yesterday, I caught up with NASDAQ CEO Adina Friedman at CES in Las Vegas, just as the SEC approval of Bitcoin ETFs was announced. Take a listen to her reaction and what she has to say in particular about future regulation. What it really tells you is that from a regulatory point of view, there's been some maturing of the Bitcoin markets to the point where the SEC has now said we approve these new vehicles that allow retail investors to access Bitcoin. They don't have to actually buy underlying Bitcoin, but they can have an opinion about the, the trends in Bitcoin and they can express themselves in a regulated market, um, which of course is NASDAQ. So and also these instruments are highly liquid and it makes it so that they have ready access to the, you know, the, uh, an investor vehicle in this space. So we're, we're excited to be their partner. There are some sort of cerebral, somewhat academic debates about Bitcoin in particular, about whether it is a risk asset, an asset class. Uh, if it is not, it, is it a store of value? Is the NASDAQ approach that, that this development kind of moves towards a, a deeper focus on crypto as an asset class? I think I have to look at it a little differently. You know, we have we have ETFs that reflect lots of different instruments and asset classes, whether it's commodities or equities, bonds, other other forms of you know OTC instruments. As long as they're liquid and they have a solid underlying price discovery mechanism, which now the SEC is saying the Bitcoin ETF, the underlying the underlying market provides price discovery for the ETF and they are approving the ETF. So I think that that's a, an interesting signal. But I also would say that that's our job is to provide create index products. We have about $500 billion of assets under management in our own indexes. And then to be the listing exchange for those index provider products that allow investors to invest in all sorts of tradable instruments, including now Bitcoin. Okay, final question on this subject. Let's go back 24 hours almost. Uh, an SEC X account posts. We now know that it was an unauthorized post. It was a hack. Um, uh, 
we are looking into it, but Twitter, or X, formerly known as Twitter, have explained what they believed happened. Just as the CEO of a leading exchange, just explain to me what, what it was like for you, that madness of yesterday afternoon, given our Bloomberg audience had a very similar experience. Well, I think uh, the, the, you know, the behaviors in the markets really came from looking at anything that was related to Bitcoin itself. So the okay. underlying Bitcoin markets and then sort of any sort of public companies that had that kind of underlying asset class as part of their, their business. But I think for us, it's really a matter of making sure that we think about more generally what protections we put in place as more technology is used to drive trading, but also as more information is being used in real time to direct people, investors. And we look at it more from our protection perspective. Uh, we, first of all, want to think about as, as AI comes more into the markets, how do we uh, regulate that appropriately? And I think both the SEC and the CFTC have expressed that they're going to be interested in that. What kind of smart regulation can be put in place? That was Adina Friedman, NASDAQ Chair, President and CEO. Carrie. We've got to keep on talking crypto. The conversation continues The Jack Manners, his strike CEO. Of course, digital wallet built on Bitcoin's Lightning Network is an important layer two offering to make basically the transactions on Bitcoin that much faster, easier, smoother. I'm interested, Jack, because you have been someone who's been developing this space, thinking about crypto and Bitcoin in particular for a decade. It took a decade for us to get to this point, a spot Bitcoin ETF, when, of course, we saw the brothers of Inclevine brothers come out and want to get into this spot Bitcoin ETF scenario. What does it mean to you? Oh, man. Well, first of all, happy Bitcoin ETF day. Thank you guys for having me. Uh, I think it's a huge deal. I, I view Bitcoin as the best expression of fiat debasement. What I mean by that is as nation states and central banks uh, print more of their own currency and devalue it, like devaluing the U.S. dollar, I think Bitcoin is the best expression of that. You can see that most in the rise of Bitcoin's price, and it's because of two things. It's the scarcest asset on the planet. You can't make any more of it. And it's one of the only asset classes in the world that demands energy uh, to acquire it. And so those two things make it the best expression of what's increasingly the biggest problem that money managers have, which is how to take the other side of governments inevitably printing their way out of all this debt. And so the fact that Wall Street said, you know what, those hoodie coders over the last decade, boy, they got loud mouths like that Jack guy. But we got to get in on this, too, because the government looks like they're going to stop uh, QT and start QE. And, and we need to own an asset that uh, protects us. And I think that's Bitcoin. So monumental day. Let's go. Uh, all right, Jack, let's go. Jack, do we need 11 different ETFs to do that? You know who knows best, Ed? The free market. <laughs> and I think it's important that Wall Street allows for that. So we'll see. The market will tell us. My personal opinion, probably not. That seems a bit excessive. But I'm here for it, and I love it. So uh, we'll see. The free market, I think, uh, will fix a lot of this stuff. I also am not entirely sure how Wall Street and their T plus 2 settlement is going to handle the apex predator that is Bitcoin. I think it'll be an interesting journey over the next 12 months to see how many of these things are left and how they're able to handle an asset that doesn't have off hours that doesn't have supply that you can go print more of or that you can call the CEO and tell them to calm down. It's a new beast for Wall Street, but uh, they talk a big game, so hopefully they're plenty, plenty uh, capable. <laughs> when I posted on X that you were coming on the show and you, you replied with your, your Apex Predator thesis, lots of people had some pretty cerebral questions for you, one of which is, has Bitcoin kind of lost its original ethos? by being accessible as an ETF. The wording of one user is the original ethos of Bitcoin gone. Now the ETFs will start to maintain custody of Bitcoin. No, the most important principle of Bitcoin is that you're not required to centralize your custody or to conform to a monetary policy that's outside of your control. Anyone can still do whatever they want with Bitcoin. I've got some stored right in the other room, and there's nothing BlackRock could do about that. But if someone wanted to use Bitcoin with BlackRock, go for it. That doesn't break any principle or change any type of culture set whatsoever. Like I said, I think it's monumental that the world has access 
to a monetary supply where it cannot be inflated and that absolutely demands energy to hold it. Those two things protect you against inflation and the devaluing of currency. And so if people want to get that through BlackRock, I'd question it. I think it's maybe a little expensive. It's not for everybody, but go for it. I don't I don't think it's anyone's position to say what you can or can't do in Bitcoin. That's why it's important. What's interesting about Strike in particular is you have Strike Private, which you help pl private clients, ultimately those high net worth individuals, those family offices that did want exposure to Bitcoin before this suddenly incredibly easy ETF was available. Is that in any way going to implicate your business? So, so we're seeing all time high numbers even back to December. This is now a trend leading up to this event. And the way we think about ourselves is we're one of the best in the world at Bitcoin, if not the best. And what that means is technology, licensing, global access. When it comes to Bitcoin, this new thing, uh, we're one of the best in the world at that. And so Wall Street may take a sector of high net worth institutional clients that we probably never were going to serve anyway, but it lifts all boats. It lifts all boats. I really don't think that this is a winner take all or a winner take most market. This is an entirely new monetary network and we're one of the best in the world at it. So we're stoked. We're stoked to see the attention. We're stoked to see the validity. We're stoked to see the maturity. And uh, we're here for it. I, I think, you know, in, in five to 10 years, being one of the best in the world at this thing is going to be a really, really good business. And that's why I'm the founder and CEO of it. So we're happy. <laughs> What's interesting is, of course, in the US, Bitcoin has been seen basically as, well, an, an asset to be able to bet on. Ultimately, whether or not it's a store of value, it's certainly been one that people have been wanting to gain exposure to, to see it as volatile, to see the gains. But elsewhere in the world, they do use it as a way of also ultimately being able to transact, to use it as some sort of currency. Now, when does that potentially start to seep into the US? Because at the moment, we've seen the validity of it as an asset, as a store of value, but not as a currency here in the United States. Um, I'm not, to, to be honest, guys, I'm not sure it totally matters. Um, so for example, I don't own any dollars anymore. I'm sick of them. You know, I think the real risk is owning dollars because all they do is go down. And traditionally, the game was, well, shoot, what do I own? The government's going to keep printing currency. They're in so much debt. Do I try and own a house? Do I try and own an index of stocks? Do I try and find out what Jeff Bezos is up to now that he's not the CEO of Amazon? And Bitcoin is the most accessible, most simple, best expression of this problem. That You know, Ed, how many people in the world have to deal with fiat debasement? Give me a number. What do you think? You answer that, Jack. Eight billion. All of us. Hmm. Everybody is subject to a fiat currency that's devaluing. And everyone has access to this thing. And so if you want to use it for payments, if you want to store it. So, for example, I live on credit cards. The U.S. banking system gives me a 30-day revolving door of credit where I could spend dollars without needing to own those pieces of trash. <laughs> and so I just sit in right. Bitcoin all day. I, I spend on credit. And so to me, I don't know. Anyway, does that answer your question? I think, I think Jack, it doesn't totally we matter. Jack, we have five seconds. Where does Bitcoin peak in 2024? Uh, this count, I, I think we see new highs this year, and I think uh, this thing lands between 250K to a million, around the $500,000 range at some point in 25. I think uh, there's a lot of money printing that the government's going to have to do, and, right. and this is the fastest horse. Uh, Jack Mallers, Strike CEO. Thank you very much for your time. Always colorful on this program. Thank you. We'll check in on the health of the industry when it comes to healthcare and venture capital with Dina Shakir coming up next from Lux Capital. This is Bloomberg Technology. With the JP Morgan Healthcare Conference in full swing in SF, let's discuss the state of the health tech space with Dina Shaka, general partner over at Lux Capital, a venture firm with more than $5 billion of assets focusing on emerging science and tech companies. Dina, Happy New Year. Uh, happy I was New in Year. Las Vegas. Happy New Year. I was in Las Vegas at CES, and, and unusually, JP Morgan happening at the same time in San Francisco. Uh, is there one single defining piece of gossip that went on in the hallways of that hotel? More than one, Ed, that's for sure. I would say the mood was generally cautiously optimistic. Lots of excitement around the acronyms AI, GLP-1, um, and really the intersection of bio and digital in 2024. And therefore, was there exuberance around writing checks 
to these Venn diagrams that might not overlap, overlap as much as might be anticipated, but I'm interested as to whether people wanted to go in and still support these companies or whether it's still a story of having to do more with less. Well, exuberance is not quite the word I would use, but I would say there was, you know, interest and excitement. JPM is traditionally more focused on the public side of things, but of course that does have a, a, a direct impact on privates, and there is a sort of a private track at the conference. Lots of announcements around M&A on the pharma side, around big partnerships with AI and health systems, and so you can expect investors to continue to be excited about those particular intersections, both on the bio side as well as healthcare, as they look toward early stage funding. And what's been interesting is on the bio side, there's been a sort of spate of M&A happening to kick off the new year, but also a valuation questioning going on in the public markets, at least when it comes to big tech, the, the Magnificent Seven. There must have been a lot of discussion about what the public markets means for the private markets, in particular about IPOs, about exits. Dina, how are you seeing that evolve for 2024? That was the question I probably got asked the most, both from companies and other investors. You know, if I could look into a crystal ball, which I cannot, what does 2024 look like for IPOs? You know, I think it looks a little better than it did in 2023. I don't think it's going to be a watershed moment yet for public markets. I think we'll we'll start to see a bit more excitement, and perhaps 2025 is the year where uh, we start to return to what we saw in previous years. Um, but I do think there is some movement happening. The M&A is definitely paving the path. Um, and as you heard from Adina and others on the public side, I expect there will continue to be more movement as we move uh, toward the second half of 2024. Dina, when Lux raised the new fund in April, $1.15 billion, it was for deep tech and science-focused investments. Nine months on, how much of that is translated to healthcare, biotech, pharma? You know, quite a bit, Ed. In fact, if you uh, listened to some of the presentations at JPM, you would hear specifically that the interest from pharma on the M&A side is specifically around the science, not necessarily on, you know, financial aspects of the company at that stage. Folks are looking to keep up with the GLP-1 innovation that has been an absolute game changer in healthcare. Where is the science breakthrough? And that's really where Lux has been investing, uh, you know, for the past several decades and where we can Continue to invest deep, deep tech science on the healthcare side, certainly on AI. We're seeing a lot of intersections of the areas where we have traditionally invested, um, both from presentations at JPM from our portfolio as well as others. And so that's where I think there'll continue to be a lot more. How can you apply LLMs and foundational models to actually improve healthcare outcomes? How can technology change the way healthcare is delivered to Medicaid and to women's health? Uh, and how can it change the way drugs are developed on the bio? side. And it's so great to have you back on the show, Dina. Thank you. Happy New Year. Happy New Return from Eternity Leave, Dina Shecker, of course, General Partner at Lux Capital. Victoria's Secret gets further into AI. The well-known retailer plans to create more personalized and inclusive online shopping experiences for its global customers by leveraging Google Cloud's generative AI technologies. Here for more on where these relationships evolve, Carrie Tharp, Vice President of Industries at Google Cloud, along with Chris Rupp, Chief Customer Officer at Victoria's Secret. And Chris, I start with you, because where do you want to see the impact first and foremost for Victoria's Secret? Well, we'd love to see the impact in our customer experience. We believe there's a lot we can leverage with Google's AI platform to create better customer shopping experiences. Carrie, what's so interesting is AI, the hype cycle, everyone discussing it, all businesses in their earnings reports, but yet the adoption in real world perhaps has been a bit slower than the talk. I think of the November survey for the Census Bureau saying only well, just over 4% of all businesses are actually using AI to produce services, to produce products. How are you seeing the adoption start to ramp? It's ramping very quickly. We consider 2024 to be the activation year. So you're seeing live experiences with retailers today using that Vertex AI platform to bring better consumer facing experiences. So uh, brands like Macy's are using our retail search today already. The Home Depot and Kroger are already bringing these experiences to their associates, bringing more information and training. So even though you may not think you've touched a generative experience, 
experience from Google. It's coming to you fast in 2024. How, Chris, does the generative experience, as Carrie says, how does that impact your employees in particular? There's been a little bit of fear about them being replaced. Does the focus on operational efficiencies in any way impact how many people you need in customer care, for example? Uh, actually, the way we're thinking about how generative AI can help us is how it can help us on the sales floor serve customers better. So when you think about uh, the difference between a very experienced sales associate and someone who's brand new on the sales floor, the more experienced sales associate knows much more about our products and the services that we offer. But if we could help even the brand new associate understand the breadth of our product catalog and be able to serve customers faster and better, we would be able to convert many more of our visitors into customers. So that's what we're focused on. Carrie, when you are going through the relationships that you're doing, not only with Victoria's Secret, but you mentioned how you're working with Home Depot, Estee Lauder's in there, Kroger, McDonald's. What is the most surprising way in which you've seen a business adopt, adapt, and leverage it? I don't know that it's surprising. Everybody's really starting with those big business challenges and frictions, just as Chris described at Victoria's Secret, closing the gap in things they've dreamt about, getting closer to their customers. So Estee Lauder is an example where they want to have a deep understanding of what their customers saying in social and in their uh, customer service channels. And so that's an example of just unique ways to get at customer insights and interactions that the technology just didn't enable them to in past years. Our shopping experiences are going to change inevitably. We thank you both for running us through the relationship. Carrie Tharp, Vice President of Industries at Google Cloud, and Chris Rupp, Chief Customer Officer at Victoria's Secret. Thank you both. Meanwhile, well, that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Hey, Ed. Yeah, Carrie, check out the podcast wherever you get your podcasts. This is Bloomberg Technology.